He's an attorney and a noted Catholic author, lecturer, speaker. Um, he's authored a series of books on the biblical basis of various aspects of the Catholic faith and the Catholic faith in general, and author, also author of the book uh, Freemasonry Un Masonry Unmasked, Why Catholics Cannot Be Masons. This time he's going to address us on the topic of Vatican II, the 1960s, and the title? Masonry, Vatican II, 1960, and the Masons. So uh, welcome, please, John Salza. Thank you, John. There is a body of clear and compelling testimony from the likes of Cardinal Pacelli, the future Pius XII, Father Fuentes, Father Alonso, Father Schweigel, Cardinal Oddi, Cardinal Chappi, Father Malachi Martin, even Cardinal Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict XVI, that the third secret of Fatima, not yet revealed by the Vatican, predicts a spiritual crisis in the bosom of the Church. In this presentation, I'm going to elaborate on this theme by demonstrating that this crisis is nothing less than a worldwide apostasy from the Catholic faith, fueled by the principles of Freemasonry, which would penetrate the church using an ecumenical council, corrupt the hierarchy, and threaten the gravest spiritual and material chastisements in world history. Note well that the third secret does not just announce the crisis. It identifies the causes of the crisis. And the primary cause of the crisis is the doctrinal compromises of the hijackers of Vatican II who sought to give the church a new orientation rather than unequivocally affirming what she is, the mystical body of Christ outside of which no one is saved. The fact that Pope Benedict has called for a hermeneutic of continuity when interpreting the conciliar texts proves that the continuity of the Council's teachings with the Catholic faith is legitimately in question. This explains why Our Lady, by express order, mandated that the secret be revealed in 1960, the year that the plans for the Council to begin. Vatican II was the only major historical event that could possibly be connected to, with 1960 and the Third Secret, which must be admitted even by those who have accepted the Vatican's position on Fatima. Now, Pope John XXIII announced the Council the previous year, January 25, 1959. And as Providence deranged, this day was the anniversary of the beginning of World War II, January 25, 1938, as foretold in the second part of the secret. And now, Pope John's announcement for this revolutionary Council on the same date also made it the beginning of the devil's war on the church, as foretold in the third part of the secret. Just as the second secret predicted a material chastisement by means of natural war, the third secret predicts a spiritual chastisement by means of a spiritual war, both announced on January 25th. And just as the crisis of war was preceded by a light unknown in the sky, as Our Lady described in the second secret, the crisis of faith was preceded by novelties unknown to the Church, introduced through Vatican II, as warned in the third secret. Note that it was only after Pope John announced the Second Vatican Council that he read the third secret. In August 1959, he read the currently suppressed text of Our Lady's words, and in 1960, he read the other part pertaining to the vision of the bishop dressed in white. Since he knew the secret couldn't be revealed until 1960 by express order of Our Lady, and he was also aware that the secret revealed a coming apostasy in the church, it's as if Pope John called the council in 1959 before he actually read the secret as a preemptive act of silencing Our Lady in 1960, which of course he did, or as Antonio Sochi says, to put before heaven a fait accompli, in Italian un fatto compiuto. And hence John XXIII stated in his opening address to the council, quote, we must disagree with those prophets of doom who are always forecasting disaster, end quote. It certainly appears that the Pope was referring to Lucia Jacinta and Francisco as those prophets of doom. 
But if that is the case, his statement must also reserve to Our Lady, who forecasted through the three seers this pending gloom and disaster for the church if her requests were not granted. And so by disagreeing with Our Lady, the seat of wisdom and mother of mercy, Pope John decided to carry on with his counsel and table the secret. And as he tabled it, he said, the third secret does not apply to my pontificate. But if the third secret only warned of a world war or even a massive planetary catastrophe, how could he know that such events didn't apply to his pontificate? He couldn't predict the future. Think about Pope John's statement. By saying it doesn't apply to my pontificate strongly indicates that the third secret warns of a decisive pontifical act. For if the secret warned only of a world war or a natural disaster, he couldn't say those events, uh, events didn't apply to his pontificate because he wouldn't know that. So the secret would seem to warn of a papal act within a pope's control, such as calling a revolutionary ecumenical council and charting a new direction for the church, which he could later attempt to disclaim and said it applied to a future pope. But how could Pope John say that 1960 did not apply to his pontificate when it clearly did? That shows the wisdom of Our Lady, who made 1960 integral to the secret by having Lucia write it down on both envelopes of the two texts, expressly ordering that the text be revealed during that year. For the popes could bury the texts, but they couldn't hide the dates written on the outsides of the envelopes, which would of course point to Vatican II. Just ask Cardinal Bertoni about that. For in 2007, he revealed on national television the text written on the outside of the two envelopes. And just as Pope John buried the secret, so his successors have done the same, because they, the implementers of this new orientation taken at Vatican II, are the very objects of the prophecy spoken by Our Lady. They are chiefly responsible for the crisis. Of course, the good and orthodox teachings of Vatican II are not in question. But at the same time, all of the radical changes in the church in the last 50 years since 1960, whether theology or liturgy or discipline, are ultimately attributed to Vatican II by both modernists and traditional Catholics alike, by both defenders and, and critics of Vatican II. We both agree that these alterations were born from the letter or the spirit of the council. Modernists use the Council to justify their errors, while Catholics use the Council, in light of the infallible definitions of the Church, to highlight their errors. And this is why 1960 is the dividing line as Our Lady so generously revealed to us. The dividing line between the crisis forewarned and the crisis commenced. Or as a Thomist would say, the crisis in potency and the crisis in act. The harm brought about by the Council explains why Sister Loosely could not write the third secret down for several months, even while she was under a direct order from her bishop to do so. Because the third secret reveals a chastisement that has no precedent in church history. Lucia didn't have any problem writing down the first two parts of the secret, which were terrifying enough. A vision of hell where demons torture countless souls, prophecies of wars and persecution, sufferings for the Holy Father, even the annihilation of nations. Lucia was able to write down all of these things because there were historical precedents for them. There were precedents for war, for suffering, for martyrdoms of the faithful, even the Pope, and the annihilation of entire nations in the second part of the secret that she freely wrote down seems to be a much worse material chastisement than a martyrdom of a single pope and selected clerics and laity in a particular city in the third part of the secret. There was even historical precedent for mass heresy to afflict the church at large during the Arian crisis where most of the church's hierarchy had a heretical, they held a heretical view of Christ and only a handful of bishops remained orthodox. So why did Lucy need a divine intrusion from Our Lady to write down the third secret? Why? Because there was no precedent for an ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church to contribute 
to a universal apostasy which would result in a catastrophic decline in every aspect of the church's life and lead untold millions of souls to damnation. This would have been completely unthinkable, not only for a simple religious who viewed her superiors as authentic representatives of God, but for any faithful Catholic in the 20th century. Given that the previous 20 ecumenical councils were dogmatic, which defined truth, condemned error, which is the council's moral obligation, there was no precedent for a pastoral council, much less one that would define no dogma and yet affect a revolution within the church to make it appear as if dogma had changed. Remember, the heart of the third secret regards the dogma of the faith. As Father Schweigel confirmed in his 1952 interview with Sister Lucy, the phrase, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc., is the beginning of the third secret. And what logically follows is that the dogma of the faith will not be preserved elsewhere. And this lack of preserving dogma, this attack on dogma, is tied to 1960 and thus to Vatican II. And Sister Lucy confirmed this connection in her letter to Mother Martins of September 16, 1970. While my presentation is primarily about the spiritual chastisement, the spiritual being more harmful to souls, I want to briefly address the material chastisement prophesied in the third secret as well. As scripture reveals and as Lucia confirmed, God sends material chastisements as a punishment for sin. And there's no greater sin than apostasy from the faith especially a universal apostasy in the bosom of the church itself, which means that the conditional punishment warned of in the third secret is so incredibly terrifying as to be unlike anything mankind has ever experienced, which is another reason why Lucia may have had difficulty committing the secret to writing. In 1984, Cardinal Ratzinger said, quote, the things contained in this third secret correspond to what has been announced in scripture and has been said in many other Marian apparitions, end quote. Those other apparitions would include La Salette, where Our Lady revealed that Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist, and Akita, which Cardinal Ratzinger said is essentially the same as Fatima, and a statement he made in 2001 to Howard D., the former Philippine ambassador to the Vatican. On October 13, 1973, on the anniversary of the Miracle of the Sun, our Lady revealed to Sister Sasagawa at Akita, Japan, that God will inflict a great punishment upon humanity, greater than the deluge, where fire will fall from the sky, killing a great part of humanity. The devil will infiltrate the church. Clerics will oppose each other. Those in the church will accept compromises. Churches will be sacked and consecrated souls will be lost. Of course, none of this information is contained in the first two parts of the secret that the Vatican has revealed which means there's a missing text. Now, there is a precedent for God wiping out most of humanity as a punishment for sin. This happened with the flood during the time of Noah. And there is also precedent for God raining fire from heaven when he killed the Sodomites for their sins of homosexuality. But Our Lady of Akita says that this chastisement will be such as one will never have seen before. Why? I think several reasons. First, because God's wrath will have reached such a level that he will kill, quote, both the good and the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. This was not the case with the flood or the destruction of the Sodomites. In Akita's revelation, God will not discriminate, and those who survive, she says, will envy the dead. This is what will happen if the mother of God is ignored for too long. Second, these chastisements will also be coincident with a world war, also confirmed by Father Malachi Martin, that will bring almost the entire world into the slavery of communism. Also an unprecedented chastisement in world history. Our Lady appeared to a sister, Elena Aiello, who was renowned by Pius XII for, the, for her holiness. She died in 1961. And Our Lady told her that Russia would wage a sudden war against the West, which obviously includes Western Europe, and which may explain the vision of the third secret where the Pope is fleeing a devastated city in ruins before he is hunted down and killed. Russia would likely attack and destroy Rome. Sister Aiello also had a vision of the Russian flag 
flying atop of St. Peter's Basilica. But the West also includes Canada and the United States. Remember, Sister Lucy herself said that the U.S. would also become enslaved to communism if the consecration is not done in time. This revelation echoed the prophecies of Zachary of the 1840s, who revealed that Russia and China will fire missiles at North America and bring the West into bondage. Today, 170 years removed from this prophecy, we see Russia and China entering into a military alliance as they fund terrorist states in the Middle East to weaken and distract the U.S. military. Pope John Paul II has also, also indirectly acknowledged the veracity of these prophecies when he was in Fulda, Germany in 1980. He was asked why the third secret was not revealed. And he first indicated that the secret reveals that millions will die instantly as they did in the flood. And he wanted to avoid what he called sensationalism. But he said also that the secret was not revealed because the Vatican didn't want to encourage the communists to take certain steps. A surprising, re surprising revelation which suggests that the secret reveals that the Russian communists will be victorious in their war against the West. Again, if the consecration does not happen in time. This is a frightening reality for us and our children and our grandchildren. And what happens to the church? Our Lady of Akita said that during this chaos, the devil will infiltrate the church and churches will be destroyed. And because the reign of communism throughout the world, the church as we know it will be forced to go underground as it did in the first century. Our Lady revealed to Blessed Catherine Emmerich that a false ecumenical church governed by an anti-pope will emerge and will be recognized by secular authorities because it will promote a one-world Masonic religion while the true church and the true pope remain in hiding. All of this prepares the stage for the Antichrist, which is why Father Malachi Martin said that what is contained in the third secret is more horrifying than World War III. The prophetic Pope St. Pius X who was given a vision of the martyrdom of the Pope revealed in the Third Secret, also warned in his encyclical on the Sion about the great movement of apostasy for the establishment of a one-world church with no dogma under the pretext of freedom and human dignity. All of this explains Cardinal Ratzinger's 1984 statement that the Third Secret reveals, quote, dangers to the faith and the life of the Christian and therefore the life of the world. Apostasy leading to unprecedented spiritual and material chastisements for all of humanity. Now, the spiritual chastisements which give rise to these punishments were revealed long before Fatima. We can begin in the 16th century at Quito, Ecuador, where our Lord and Our Lady appeared to a sister, Mariana de Jesus Torres, in apparitions that prefigured those of Fatima, and have, which have been recognized by Pope Paul V and the church at large. In 1582, God gave Sister Mariana a vision of Jesus' passion and the church engulfed in a demonic smoke, which corresponds to Paul VI's statement of the smoke entering into the temple of God after he lamented the effects of Vatican II. And God revealed in this vision that he was going to punish the church punish the people of the church by virtue of three major sins to be committed in the 20th century. Heresy, impiety, and impurity. Heresy perverts the dogma of the faith, impiety perverts the expression of the faith, and impurity perverts the morality of the faith. And Our Lady mentioned that these sins would be committed in the following ways, all of which we have seen since 1960. She first revealed that there would be a corruption of ecclesiastical customs, and these would include eliminating the Roman canon from the mass, using the vernacular instead of Latin, using tables instead of high altars, not enforcing head coverings for women, using lay readers, even women to serve the altar, many other novelties. These corruptions have happened as a result of the council's unprecedented delegation of authority over the liturgy to bishops' conferences, which have replaced these ancient usage, usages to satiate their thirst for novelties. 
Our Lady said that there would be a profanation of the Eucharist. She said that hosts would be stolen, profaned, desecrated. This was unthinkable until the wake of the Council, where tabernacles were, were removed from the church proper, lay people were allowed to handle the Blessed Sacrament, even to distribute Holy Communion and to standing communicants in the hand. These novelties were born out of the Council's deficient definition of the Mass as a memorial, a mere memorial of our Lord's death and resurrection, a type of, of fellowship meal rather than the propitiatory sacrifice of the cross of Christ offered through his priests to satisfy God's justice and appease his wrath against sin and the miracle of transubstantiation. Our Lady said that sacraments would fall into disuse and we see this particularly with confession which has become almost extinct in many Novus Ordo parishes, for there has been a de-emphasis on sin, judgment, and hell, beginning with the conciliar texts, which is why Our Lady had to affirm church dogma by showing the seers a vision of hell, because she knew that hell would be all but forgotten in the 20th century. Our Lady also said that there would be immodesty and profanity in dress, even among children who would lose their innocence another prophecy for the 20th century fulfilled. She further said that the sacrament of matrimony would be profaned. And we, we see this not only outside the church with laws that attack Christian marriage, but also inside the church with the annulment fiasco and a perverted understanding of the primary means of marriage through some Gnostic theology of the body, which also finds its roots in the council. All of this predicted by Our Lady in the 16th century. Our Lady also said that the devil would especially attack priests in the 20th century who would become perverted and lose their vocation entirely. All the experts say that this prophecy is repeated in the third secret. And after revealing the war that the devil is waging on the church, Lucia said, quote, the devil does everything to overcome souls consecrated to God because in this way the devil will succeed in leaving souls of the faithful abandoned by their leaders, thereby the more easily will he seize them." End quote. This connection between the third secret and apostasy in the priesthood was confirmed by another, none other than Pope John Paul II himself, when at the beatification ceremony of Jacinta and Francisco, he reaffirmed Lucy's testimony by tying the message of Fatima to the Apocalypse, chapter 12, where the tale of the dragon swept down a third of the stars of heaven in reference to the consecrated souls of the church who are supposed to illumine the path to heaven. In other words, the third secret of Fatima reveals that a substantial number of Catholic clergy are working for the devil and leading souls to hell. And in 1610, Our Lady made an astonishing revelation. She said in the 20th century, the year of the Second Vatican Council, Satan would reign almost exclusively through Freemasonry. If the third secret warns of the council and Satan would attack the church in the 20th century primarily through Freemasonry, it follows that the council and Freemasonry work together to bring about the crisis, whether through the intent or the negligence of the pastors, but certainly by diabolical design. How so? Well, even as Freemasons admit, through Vatican II's ambiguous and unprecedented formulations, for example, on ecumenism, which Pius XII had previously condemned in 1949, on religious liberty, always condemned by the Church, which seems to say that man has a natural right based on his dignity to worship as he sees fit, through its unfounded praise for non-Christian religions with the Church had theretofore always held to be obstacles to salvation. And by means of a new ecclesiology which seems to broaden the means of salvation beyond the church proper. Such principles are drawn from the lodge, not the perennial magisterium. While addressing even a handful of these teachings is well beyond the scope of this presentation, and while not judging the subject, subjective intentions of the council fathers, not judging their intentions, only looking objectively at the texts, it is necessary to just briefly address the most fundamental one, 
the one that has at the heart of the third secret, the one that both Freemasonry and communism held to be the most dangerous. That is the thrice infallibly defined dogma, no salvation outside the church. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus est. In Vatican II's Lumen Gentium, it says the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, which scholars admit could be interpreted to mean that the Church of Christ may be something different, something bigger than the Catholic Church. For it doesn't say that the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church or subsists only in the Catholic Church. And never before had a council used such interpret uh, terminology, which could be subject to so many heretical interpretations. Lumen Gentium also says that many elements of truth and sanctification are found outside its visible confines. And Unitatis Redintegratio defined those elements as the life of grace, including the supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity. So the council does not appear to be talking about actual grace being operative outside the church, which then moves a non-Catholic to the church to receive sanctifying grace in baptism, at which time, and only at which time, he receives the life of grace. Rather, the council appears to say that this life of grace, evidenced by the presence of faith, hope, and charity, exists outside the church as well. And this is extremely problematic, to say the least. Unitatis goes on to say that the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them, non-Catholic religions, as a means of salvation, end quote. And this can be interpreted to say that the Holy Ghost uses false religions to save souls. But how can there be no salvation outside the church if the Holy Ghost saves men outside the church? The Holy Ghost does not operate in non-Catholic communities as communities, but only in the individual souls of its members by means of actual grace to move them to the church, the only means by which they can receive sanctifying grace. But the council specifically states that, quote, by means of them, that is, by means of false religions, the spirit of Christ saves souls. Again, never before had a council ever taught such a thing, for it does call into question her infallible dogma. And this is what Our Lady was warning about in the third secret. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, but not elsewhere, even among the members, the highest ranks of the church which would begin to unfold in 1960. Indeed, the forewarned crisis stems from the doctrinal compromises brought about by Masonic forces within the church. This attack on the dogma, no salvation outside the church, was the first and necessary step in the Masonic plan of achieving a common denominator religion, inclusive of all faiths, because it quickly removes the two most basic tenets of the faith, the necessity of Christ and his church, for you cannot separate the two, and the necessity of submission to Christ and his vicar, for you cannot separate the two. Once you remove the supernatural necessity of the church, you are left with a religion of naturalism, and that is the religion of Freemasonry, and incidentally, of Russian communism as well. As such, these teachings of Vatican II have received the praise not only of Protestants, but of Freemasons as well. For example, French Freemason Yves Mossedon, in his book, Ecumenism Viewed by a Traditional Freemason, says, quote, All roads lead to God, and this free thinking pouring forth from Masonic lodges has spread magnificently over the dome of St. Peter's, end quote. Another French Freemason, Jacques Mitterrand, in acknowledging the internal struggle of the church since Vatican II, wrote, quote, something has changed within the church. The word of the sovereign pontiff is questioned by bishop, by priests, by faithful. For a Freemason, a man who questions dogma is already a Freemason without an apron, end quote. In short, Quito and Fatima predict the same thing. The church will be overtaken by Masonic ideology beginning in 1960, which would corrupt her liturgy, her theology, and her very soul. And this was precisely the prophecy of the future Pope Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli, who in 1931 said the following, quote, 
I am worried by the Blessed Virgin Mary's messages to Lucia Fatima. This persistence of Mary about the dangers which menace the church is a divine warning against the suicide of altering the faith in her liturgy, her theology, and her soul." End quote. This altering of the faith directly corresponds to the three sins our Lord revealed at Quito, which would be made manifest in the 20th century, beginning in 1960 and fueled by masonry. Impiety results from altering the, altering the church's liturgy. Heresy results from altering the church's theology. And impurity results from altering the faith in the church's soul. The soul deals with the nature of being, and thus the soul deals with the nature of the church, which teaching has been compromised by the council's new ecclesiology. But the soul of the church also regards the morality of her members. Remember, morality follows doctrine. So if the doctrine is compromised, the morality is weakened as a consequence. And this explains not only the apostasy among some of the highest clerics in the church, but also the clerical sexual abuse scandal, which Pope Benedict last year confirmed is connected to the third secret, as he described, sins within the church. Sexual perversion, which is running rampant in the church, is a consequence of idolatry, that is, worshiping the creature instead of the creator, which is promoted by the naturalism of Freemasonry and a false understanding of human dignity. Whether by divine intrusion or specific knowledge, the future Pope based his prophecies on the message of Fatima. But his prophecies cannot be based on anything the Vatican has revealed to date, for what has thus far been revealed says nothing about attack on the Church's liturgy and theology and soul. So it must refer to the missing text. Now, at Quito, Our Lady referred to masonry in the 20th century. At Fatima, Our Lady referred to Russia in 1960. What is the connection? The connection is that the errors in, of Russia and the errors of Freemasonry are one and the same. Right after Our Lady appeared at Fatima, Russian communism was born, which, like masonry, rejects the supernatural revelation of God and Jesus Christ in favor of a religion of naturalism. And naturalism as, naturalism, as Blessed Pius IX teaches, leads to a practical atheism, which is the chief error of Russia. In Humanum Genus, Pope Leo XIII confirms that communism and Freemasonry work in tandem to destroy God's church. He says, quote, this change and overthrow is deliberately planned and put forward by many associations of communists and socialists and the sect of Freemasons who greatly favor their designs and hold in common with them their chief opinions." End quote. Pope Leo's teaching has been confirmed by historical facts that both Freemasonry and Russian Communism have designed to successfully infiltrate the Catholic Church to spread their errors. First, Freemasonry's plan, which was articulated in the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita, this is a document written in the mid-1850s by an Italian sect of Freemasonry called the Carbonari, and this revealed that Masonry's plan to penetrate the Catholic Church by infiltrating seminaries and monasteries and schools to spread liberalism among the youth, which would form future bishops and ultimately produce a pope that the document says would be according to our needs. Liberalism would be marked by humanitarian principles, liberty, equality, fraternity, human dignity, terms that you constantly hear used by the conciliar church and by Freemasons in their pursuit of a one world pan religion without Christ. The conciliar church has become what Freemasonry wanted, no longer viewed as the sole ark of salvation, but rather a collaborator and dialogue partner with other religious communities striving to build a utopia on earth, a civilization of love through brotherhood and peace. We also know about Pope Leo XIII's vision while he was celebrating mass of a dark fog covering the church like Quito with demons attacking the church, almost bringing it to collapse 
at which point the Pope yelled out, no salvation is possible in the church? He said in Italian it's recorded, ma nessuna salvezza è possibile nella chiesa? Revealing that the salvation dogma we just addressed would be compromised within the church itself. And after St. Michael defeated the demons and threw them back into hell, Pope Leo heard a voice from heaven which said, all of this will begin to happen in various pontificates and will come true because of Russia. And when would this happen precisely? In the famous conversation that Pope Leo heard between Jesus and Satan, where Satan told Christ he would destroy the Church of Christ if our Lord gave him 75 to 100 more years, which Christ granted to him. Well, 75 years from Pope Leo's vision brings us precisely to 1960, and 100 years to the aftermath, or should we say rubble, of Vatican II. After this vision, Pope Leo issued more encyclicals on Our Lady and more condemnations of Freemasonry than any other pope in history, thereby connecting the attack on the church's dogma with Freemasonry's battle against the Blessed Virgin. Around the same time as Pope Leo's vision, the excommunicated apostate, Canon Roca, who was quoted by Bishop Graeber in his book, Athanasius in the Church of Our Time, predicted the subversion of the church and that this transformation would happen at an ecumenical council, which would create a new religion, a new dogma, with a pluriconfessional pontificate engaging in ecumenical celebrations with non-Catholics. Remember, Scripture allows unbelievers to prophesy. Look at the example of Caiaphas. Just as the evil Caiaphas accurately prophesied about the passion of Christ at the hands of the Jewish leaders of the Old Covenant, the evil Canon Rocha accurately prophesied about the passion of Christ's church at the hands of the Catholic leaders of the New Covenant. In terms of Russians, Russia's communism's plans to infiltrate the church, about the same time that Padre Pio had a revelation that Masonry was going to penetrate the church, Lenin, the founder of Russian communism, said that he would infiltrate the church and take control of the Vatican. Remember, St. Pio would also say that during the reign of Paul VI, that, quote, Satan had entered even the shoes of the Pope. In the 1930s, ex-communist Douglas Hyde revealed that communist leadership had a worldwide directive to infiltrate the Catholic Church, just as the Masons had planned in the Alta Vendita. And in the 1950s, ex-communist Belladad testified that communism had put 1,100 men into the priesthood by the 1930s to destroy the church from within, and that they were in the highest places in the church by the time of Vatican II, 1960. Like the Alta Vendita, Dodd said that the communist mission was not to destroy the institution of the church, for that would be impossible, but the faith of the people by opening up the church to the religions of the world to form a single ecumenical pseudo-religion. Our Lady's warnings that Russia would spread her errors even into the heart of the church is confirmed by another historical fact. In 1962, the Vatican signed an agreement with a schismatic Russian Orthodox sect known as the Vatican-Moscow Agreement or Metz Pact in which the Vatican agreed not to condemn Soviet communism or Russia at Vatican II in exchange for Pope John's wish that two Russian Orthodox observers attend his council. And so, in exchange for the presence at an ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, of two heretics who rejected the Catholic Church, the Vatican agreed not to uphold the teaching of the Catholic Church that communism is the greatest institutionalized form of evil that has ever existed, which has taken the lives of untold millions of Catholics, and which is the principal material chastisement warned of in the third secret. And it is no coincidence that the documented communist infiltration of the church was chronologically followed by the Vatican's policy of Ostpolitik, as it is called, in which the Vatican has ceased condemnations of communist regimes in favor of dialogue and quiet diplomacy. 
And in the face of this quiet diplomacy, Russia continues to persecute the Catholic Church while the Vatican remains silent, just as Russia prepares with China to wage war on the West. That communist influence has penetrated the Church is also proven by the fact that schismatic communist priests of the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association have been given canonical missions and priestly faculties in American dioceses, where agents of a communist regime learn the secrets of and give spiritual direction to American Catholics. And then we have traditional Catholic priests, such as those of the Society of St. Pius X, who uphold the true message of Fatima and have even orchestrated rosary crusades for the consecration of Russia, including the current one recently launched by His Excellency Bishop Fillet, who are given no canonical mission by the Vatican. Given the infiltration we have documented, it is no surprise that the Vatican has also negotiated the Balaman Declaration of 1993 with the Orthodox Schismatics, agreeing that any attempts to convert them to the true church is, quote, outdated ecclesiology. Today, the Vatican calls the Orthodox schismatic communities sister churches and their heretical patriarchs as pastors in the church, again, compromising the nature of the church and her infallible dogma. And being a sister church with no pressure from the Vatican to convert to the true faith, the Russian Orthodox sect happily participate in Vatican II's program of ecumenism. The Orthodox have joined the World Council of Churches and holds leadership positions in this syncretist, communist, Masonic organization that seeks a unification of the world's religions. In fact, the WCC is pressuring Catholic priests and bishops to join in ecumenical celebrations of the Holy Mass, which is in fact occurring. And if this continues, we'll pave the way for Antichrist, where ecumenical masses will result in invalid consecrations where Christ will not be worshipped, but rather an unconsecrated piece of bread and a cup of wine, an idol in the temple of God, the abomination of desolation prophesied by Daniel and our Lord. The Vatican's treatment of the Russian Orthodox is also a direct affront to Our Lady of Fatima. After all, it is the conversion of Russia that will usher in the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. But that cannot happen under the current regime where the Vatican no longer seeks the conversion of Russia to the Catholic faith. God wants to convert Russia, but he will not do so until the Pope obeys Our Lady's directives. Perhaps the biggest affront to Our Lady of Fatima and evidence of the spirit of Freemasonry having penetrated into the church is the many pan-religious gatherings previously condemned by the magisterium in which the conciliar church now participates, including those at Assisi, which has all, always raised a question in my mind. If John Paul II's 1984 consecration met Our Lady's prescriptions for world peace, as the Vatican claims, then why did the Pope hold an international prayer gathering for world peace in Assisi in 1986? for which he started to prepare immediately after the 1984 consecration. Either he didn't trust Our Lady's promise, or he didn't believe that he properly performed the consecration in 1984, which we know that he effectively admitted when he referred to those people who still await the consecration after he performed the 1984 ceremony. The Vatican has announced that there will be another Assisi summit this coming October. And aside from the scandal and departure from the entire Catholic tradition, which forbids prayer gatherings with unbelievers, Assisi raises many troubling theological questions. For example, if the participants are called to prayer as they were in the past, I've asked myself, who will the non-Christians at Assisi be praying to? It is a most fundamental question, and we have every right to ask it. If they are praying to false gods, then objectively speaking, how can we not conclude that the Vatican 
is at least materially cooperating in the gravest of sins committing by those with the gravest of responsibilities. Sadly, a clear manifestation of the diabolical disorientation in the church. And does this practice not also suggest that praying to false gods is somehow an avenue to the true God who will respond to these petitions? This is some, something so completely foreign to Catholic theology as to warrant no further comment. The fact that the unbelievers in the past two Assisi meetings were sent off to separate rooms and behind walls of isolation demonstrates an acknowledgement by the Vatican that there is false worship going on, for we do not separate in that way from those who are worshiping the true God. Assisi is the religion of Freemasonry, not Catholicism. And this is part of the spiritual chastisement of the third secret of Fatima. Those who will not concede that there are problems with Assisi would necessarily have to argue that the unbelievers are praying to the true God. This is the religion of Freemasonry. This is the Lodge's teaching. Everybody worships the same God. You cannot break the first commandment in the Lodge, and you cannot break the first commandment at Assisi. This, of course, violates all of Catholic tradition and scripture, which reveals that the invoking of false gods is really praying to devils. David says in the Psalms, 95.5, all the gods of the heathens are devils. And St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10.20. He says that what the unbelievers sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, not to God. As St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, God does not hear the prayers of unbelievers unless it is a prayer of repentance for salvation, but certainly not for some temporal good like world peace. Those prayers to be offered by unbelievers at Assisi for world peace will be in vain and will only invoke God's contempt for their unbelief. What we see then, ladies and gentlemen, are two peace plans. One comes from heaven, the other comes from the Vatican. In heaven's peace plan, the Pope, along with all of the bishops of the world, consecrates Russia to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. In the Vatican's peace plan, Pagans are invited to Sisi to pray to the devil. That is the conclusion that our Catholic theology demands. The Vatican wants peace without the Prince of Peace and without the Queen of Peace. In Ezekiel 13.10, God rebuked the leaders of the Old Covenant for their pursuit of worldly temporal favors when he said, They have deceived my people, saying peace, and there is no peace. St. Paul elaborates on this warning in 1 Thessalonians 5.3 by prophesying, For when they shall say peace and security, then shall sudden destruction come upon them, as the pains upon her that is with child, and they shall not escape. In Ezekiel 22.26, God also rebuked his leaders for their ecumenical practices, saying, Her priests have despised my law and have defiled my sanctuaries, they have put no difference between holy and profane, nor have distinguished between the polluted and the clean. In his first letter to the Corinthian St. Paul, who preached Christ to the unbelievers and warned Catholics not to have spiritual fellowship with them, revealed <clears throat> that these Old Testament warnings were written down for our correction upon whom the ends of the world are come. Ironically, or maybe not so ironically, the supporters of Assisi could use Vatican II to defend this abomination, which proves that the Council is the primary cause of the crisis. According to Dignitatis Humanae, the pagans have a God-given right, based on their dignity and nature, to their public worship. The Pope cannot tell them to convert to Christ because that would violate their right to religious liberty. If the church proselytizes the pagans, they can respond by saying, we have a natural right to our pagan worship, a positive right, and also a right not to be hindered by you from engaging in our pagan worship. That's called a negative right. Dignitatis Humani affirms both the positive and the negative right to non-Christian worship because they're two sides of the same coin. As St. Thomas teaches, every negation is based 
on an affirmation. Therefore, to say that Vatican II does not condone Assisi is erroneous. The problem started in 1960, not 1986 or 2002. Let's face it, for those who love the Church and love the Holy Father as we do, these are very difficult issues to talk about. But we must take the advice of Pope St. Gregory the Great. He said, quote, it is better that scandal arise than that the truth be hidden. And of Pope St. Felix III who said, quote, not to oppose error is to approve it, and not to defend truth is to suppress it, end quote. Canon law, Canon 212, also gives Catholics a right and even the duty, according to their knowledge and competence, to manifest their opinion to both the sacred pastors and laity on matters that pertain to the good of the church. And yet, there is hope. There is time, still time before 2017. The centenary of Fatima, which would appear to be the deadline for effecting the consecration as Our Lady specified. As Our Lord revealed to Sister Lucy, if the Pope does not obey these prescriptions in a timely fashion, he will have the same fate as the King of France, who was overthrown 100 years to the day after our Lord commanded his predecessor to consecrate France to his sacred heart, and which led to his execution. As the third secret reveals, the Pope will be murdered if the consecration is not done in time. Time is short indeed. And speaking of hope, it is worthwhile to note that even though the Orthodox are schismatics, they are very strict in their theological approach and in their liturgical practices. Unlike what has happened to Catholicism in the West, the Orthodox hold on to their traditions and they generally have valid priests. And this means when the Pope finally does consecrate Russia to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, Russia will convert to the traditional Catholic faith. They will be traditional Catholics. And then the world will know once again that the Catholic religion as professed and practiced before Vatican II is the only true religion. That Vatican II was a departure from the traditional faith. That the Pope, whom the Eastern Schismatics rejected a millennium ago, is truly the Vicar of Christ and Our Lady, the Mediatrix of all graces, who brought about their conversion. Fatima is the key because it puts salvations in the hands of Our Lady and the hands of the Pope, the two most distinguishable persons in Catholicism. And after the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, the Catholic faith will once again be recognized as the only true religion, a restoration of the dogma, no salvation outside the church. All of these facts are further evidence of why Our Lady demands that Russia be consecrated and why this consecration has not yet occurred. And as Pope John Paul II recognized, the message of Fatima imposes an obligation on the church by virtue of the deposit of faith, which reveals that the church is built upon the prophets of the New Testament and warns us not to despise prophecy, lest we extinguish the spirit, lest we resist the Holy Ghost. Of course, this prophecy which St. Paul cites in 1 Thessalonians 5.20 necessarily refers to the public prophetical revelations of Our Lady of Fatima approved by the Church. Let us pray that the consecration of Russia is not finally and desperately affected as a result of World War III or a supernatural planetary chastisement, but rather that the consecration prevents these disasters from occurring because even though it will be late, it will still be in time. Let us pray that this consecration is now. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Thank you.